Live from Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE. Covering Mobile World Congress 2017. Brought to you by Intel. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Palo Alto, California for special two days of Mobile World Congress. We're on day two of a wall to wall coverage from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Really breaking down what's happening in studio and going to our reporters and analysts in the field. We'll have uh, Peter Jarich coming up next and we're going to get uh, on the ground analysis from uh, the current analysis now with global data. But next we have a segment where I had a chance this morning, early <laughs> in the morning, my time, uh, top of the morning Tuesday in Barcelona, which was hours ago. I had a chance to speak with uh, Caroline Chin and Dan Rodriguez and I wanted to get their opinion on what's happening and I asked Caroline Chan, what's the biggest story coming out of Mobile World Congress? This is what she had to say. So last year, this time, the people coming in, there's a lot of questions about 5G technology. Is it real? Can they really pull it off? You know, 3G, 4G, it's a little bit of ho-hum. But this year, I would say when I look around, not just in Apple, everybody else's booth, I'm, I'm also looking to people who talk about this in the Facebook. I was did a panel last night with uh, Orange and AT&T and Telefonica, it, I think the conversation switched from will there be a 5G to solution? So I look around in, in Alpu and the next door in Verizon, there's a lot of cars, autonomous driving. Uh, we have, uh, we have that we're sizing in April smart city, smart home. It becomes from technology to solution. And then in the in the last night discussions about acceleration of 5G, like there was an announcement about the 5G NR stand alone, a whole bunch of talk about acceleration. It's really becoming how we quickly get out there. And then the other thing I've read uh, is about AI. How does AI now, because 5G becomes an enabler, right? AI in the cloud, uh, in all the analytics, the 5G can now can actually now be be able to bring that into the cloud. So AI becomes a buzzword. Uh, I just read uh, the SKT uh, CTO uh, was on MWC Live TV. You can see on the venue and talk about AI and 5G transforming the mobile industry. So it really becomes a much more of a solution oriented. No, I can't agree with uh, Caroline Moore. There's a tremendous amount of excitement around 5G as well as network transformation in this show. And they, the, the two things are really becoming linked. So Caroline mentioned a few of the use cases out there on 5G. So again, lots of autonomous driving, lots of smart home, lots of smart city. I personally had a great time hanging out in our smart home uh, demonstration earlier. But I think the key linkage of all those use cases is that the network is, needs to become more intelligent, more flexible, and definitely more agile to be able to support this wide variety of use cases. And we're seeing this theme really echoed back by not only operators, but a lot of the OEMs and, and telecommunication equipment manufacturers really rallying behind NFB and truly the path to 5G. Take a minute, guys, to explain the 5G revolution and why it's not just an evolution from 4G. What's the difference? I mean, what is the key enabler of 5G? And, and what, what does Intel have that's different now than it was uh, before? So if you imagine um, uh, 3G is all about getting uh, better voice and uh, uh, also a little bit of SMS and 4G is a little five, 3G or steroids. Now 4G has all these, uh, you can go to the internet and download all kinds of things. 5G takes that to the next level. So 3G, 2G, 3G and 4G is about network built for the masses. If you think about it, it's like a general purpose uh, uh, network. So. When you build it, and then if you, somebody vertical says, I want to uh, uh, make this a my private network, fix my enterprise, it's a best effort basis. So either it's too hard or too cold. And so, so what that means is the operator will wind up probably either giving you way too much, but not able to recoup the investment, or if they give you not enough, and you wind up with a bad user experience. 5G fundamentally changes it. Why is it changing in the standard itself that's undergoing in a 3 pp It actually have a different type of scheduling algorithm in order to fit the uh, different use cases. So, for example, if you're doing a mission-critical IoT versus a massive connected IoT, you'll get a different 
air interface protocol. You strip out some of the heavy amount of signaling that would typically need it for mission critical, for mission, for something that just there like smart city, traffic light changes, that kind of information you don't need that to dedicate a whole bunch of bandwidth. So we treat something with a different characteristic natively different the protocol itself. So that's a fundamental shift from the mindset of what we always had. So that is a technology enabled. And the second thing is that is the network today, uh, you know, thanks to all the network transformation journey that everybody's been on, it's much softer and flexible. It moves away from a single purpose uh, uh, a built hardware to something that's uh, much more flexible, such that you can enable by something like a network slicing. So uh, a slice for enhanced mobile broadband for AR, VR will be different than something for autonomous driving, search rate, than to say uh, smart city. So it, it makes the, uh, the network fundamentally different. The air interface itself is much more flexible for different type of applications. And then not to mention that we have different type of spectrum from the traditional sub three gigahertz to uh, sub six and now to millimeter waves, we open up a whole swath of a spectrum to allow for a much, much bigger bandwidth, uh, things like carry aggregation. You really start, I uh, really move, change the, change the game. Thanks, Caroline. So I think that, you know, at, at a high level, I think what Caroline was pointing out is that the wide variety of use cases with 5G will stretch and pull the network in all sorts of directions. Essentially, there'll be different use cases that require, you know, blazing fast uh, network speed plus massive amounts of bandwidth, but it's some, but some use cases already also require very uh, low latency. So when you think about all the variety of use cases, the best way uh, to truly ensure you're meeting the user experience and also delivering uh, the right economic value for the industry is to move to more intelligent uh, and a flexible network. And as Caroline mentioned, it is going to be software defined. Um, and when you think about some of the, the products that we're investing in in the data center group, uh, for networking, of course, you think about our Intel Xeon processors. Uh, these processors are going to be found in a number of servers uh, around the globe, and customers are using these for a variety of virtual network functions, really everything uh, ranging from the core network to the access network to newer uh, use cases uh, such as virtual CPE. In addition to this, uh, we did uh, announce uh, some additional products that will be made available uh, later in the year. Uh, this is the Atom uh, C3000 series, as well as the Xeon D1500 uh, network series. Both of these are SOCs, and when you think about uh, 5G, you do think about the mix of centralized and distributed deployments, and you think about that network edge becoming smarter. So these type of SOCs uh, are very critical because they provide excellent performance density at the right power level, so you can have a very, in very intelligent uh, edge of your network. Great point. Just to follow up on that, it's interesting. We had a conversation yesterday in the Cube around millimeter wave, CDMA, all the different types of, of wireless. And I think what's interesting is you have some use cases where you have a lot of density, and some cases where you need, um, you know, obviously low latency. But you also have Internet of Things, right? A car, for example, you could say we were discussing a car is essentially going to become a data center on wheels, where mobility is going to be very important and might not need precise bandwidth per se, but in a more mobile in some cases you'll need more bandwidth. And also as Internet of Things comes on, whether they're industrial devices, the, the notion of a phone being provisioned once and then being used is not the same use case as say IoT, which you could have anything connected to a, a network. These devices are gonna come on and offline all the time. So there's a real need for dynamic networks. What is Intel's approach here? Because this seems to be the conversation that most people are talking about uh, that's happening under the hood, that's the true enabler around bringing us real mobile edge. So, uh, there's, so there's, there's a couple of things that, that we're doing. Number one, we use a concept called Flex Drive, Flex Core, uh, which is a server-based uh, platform that is with uh, the variety of uh, technology that's being applied to it, lots of very least real-time virtualization, dynamic uh, uh, resource sharing, and reconfiguration, we're able to support what you just described and the, provide the flexibility to for different type of uh, scenario. And then the other thing that, that built into the 5G core network slicing allows you to slice up to prepare the right resources for the right use cases, including the uh, the the course uh, part of it. So 
For example, HPE here in that booth is demonstrating a, a, what you look like, looks like a server, walks like a server. It is a server. And it has um, the RAM, virtual PC, it has orchestration, it has mobile edge computing. It really becomes a network in a box. So, so that gives the ultimate freedom to uh, both the service providers and enterprises and to apply all the 5G different scenario use cases. Final question, guys, is market readiness through partners and collaboration. Intel obviously is the leader, Intel inside. There was uh, the, the main story we've been hearing at World World Congress is end to end. Fortunate, a great piece with Intel CEO talking about the end to end value in the underlying architecture. It all runs on Intel, it works better. It brings up the notion of market readiness and the ecosystem. What, what are you guys doing to make that ecosystem robust and vibrant? Because Intel can't do it alone, you're going to need partners. Thoughts on um, how you guys are accelerating it and really the market readiness for 5G and just timing in your mind um, when this all, all the fruit comes off the 5G tree, if you will. So we, we started with a trial this year. Uh, so 2017, we're going to be able, uh, we're working closely with partners like Ericsson, Nokia, they saw announced and Cisco. And uh, we, we should be seeing uh, early deployment coming up. And I really think the widespread uh, commercial probably is more like uh, 2019, 2020 timeframe because of some of the, uh, uh, the standardization and spectrum. And what do you think? Yeah, so, so that, that, that's a great uh, summary, Carolyn. I think that the key thing that, that we're really seeing at Mobile Congress and, and things that we're investing in, so first, as you mentioned, it, it definitely takes a village to pull off uh, the network transformation and the movement to 5G. And I think the great thing is about the network side, since the network is becoming much more pliable, more software-defined, more resilient, more agile, and it's software-defined, you can really invest in many of these innovations we've been discussing today uh, and now. So we're seeing a lot of folks start investing in uh, flex core, network in a box, uh, mobile edge computing, et cetera. So you transform your network now, utilizing network function virtualization, and then you have a sturdy foundation when all the 5G use cases come online in the next few years. Guys, final question. What power demos are you showing? You guys usually have great demos on, on the floor, Mobile World Congress, a lot of glam, a lot of, a lot of flair at the show. Uh, great question. Uh, we have a number of uh, super demos here. We have a smart and connected home, which showcases all sorts of Intel uh, wireless technologies found on the gateway, as well as other devices. We're showing a uh, smart uh, city, um, as you know, uh, you know, with 5G uh, and its, its blazing fast speeds, capacity, and lower latencies. It's truly going to change uh, the urban landscape. Uh, and we're also showing augmented and virtual reality in a few different uh, demonstrations, and one definitely caught uh, my eye, and I was pretty excited about it. Uh, in our FlexRAN demo, we were showcasing augmented virtual reality, uh, actually viewing a skier uh, going downhill, um, and it was pretty exciting. I had a great time. I can't wait to, when I'm in a few years, when 5G is out there, and I can <laughs> use augmented virtual reality to watch a number of sporting events, ranging from college football uh, to my uh, favorite sport, which is surfing. What's next for 5G? How are you guys going to roll this out? What's the big plans post Mobile World Congress? Oh, we have, uh, so we, like I mentioned, we have trial plan uh, with our, through our partners uh, 2017. And then we're also participating in the uh, Winter Olympic Showcase through, again, through our uh, customers. Uh, there's uh, activities ha happening in China that's been announced. So I think we're going to be uh, in a lot of places. You guys see us in, in 5G. Winter Olympics, expect to get the downloads and all the video in real time on 4K screens very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, it's, we're expecting yeah. to see some good bandwidth on, on the Olympics, I'm sure. Hey, thanks, John. This was thanks, great. John. Thanks, John. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Caroline Chan and Dan Rodriguez from Barcelona calling in with all the details. I'm John Furrier. We'll be back with more live coverage from Mobile World Congress after this short break. I'm George.